Welcome to the Ask Dr. Lynn Show, where your questions on Wikipedia gets answered. Many of you come to Wikipedia.com directly and now know that there is a community at Baker Forums waiting to help you out. As of last week, we hit over 1,400 members in the Academy. It's not too late to head over there and join our community today. And remember, membership is free. So join now. Join the Academy that supports the world's largest resource for technical baking information. Have a burning baking question? Bakerpedia! Still have more questions? Go to the forum or place any comments on the topics that you are researching on on Bakerpedia and I will do my best to answer them on the show. And to help me today, I have Richard Charpentier from our Baker Help Group, a new group that provides consultation to bakers like you. Here's Richard. Hello. Good afternoon. My name is Richard Charpentier. I am a baker, a French baker and also a bakery scientist. I have spent 33 years in the industry. I've worked from small mom and pop bakeries all the way to the large, highly automated commercial bakeries. So uh, my passion is quality and helping bakers you know, solve their issues. So today I will be answering questions about shelf life. And for any help, uh, you can go to the Baker Help on Bakerpedia page and uh, find uh, the help and the click on there for the forum. And I'm there as well as a consultant. So if you need help, you can find me there. So uh, without further ado, let's start with the first question. Well, this is a typical challenge that many bakeries who are ready to take it to the next steps are being are facing. So what what are the options for bakers in order to extend their shelf life products? And there are a lot of you know uh, solutions for that. One of them, you know, let's start with water activity. What is water activity? Water activity is the bound water and it's, there's a difference from the moisture. And water activity, uh, as you can look at through a, a lot of searches, it's to control how water moves around and also what will grow in your product. For example, a cookie uh, uh, will be at 0.35. A bread, water activity-wise, will be about 0.92 to 0.95 because there's a lot of water. So most of the time, bakeries, bakeries and bakers will go, uh, like for shelf-stable, will go to 8.5. But some bakeries will go as low as 0.65 to make sure no pathogen will grow. But that's a different subject to go into, you know, to go more into depth, depth into that. The second option that you can use, it would be enzymes. Enzymes are used to basically prolong the shelf life of bakery products. They come in different types. You have amylases, xylanases, lipases, uh, and, and different types and different manufacturers where they cleave special particular, you know, if you have, most of the bakers today are using amylases. And amylases is will you know the carbohydrate portion, and we'll cleave it and we'll make it a softer bite over time. And a lot of bakers are using. You'll see you know on commercial bakeries it says enzymes, so that's what they're using. They don't specifically. You do not have to label enzymes and the type of enzymes, but usually you can go to your vendors to ask what enzymes for a specific product. If it's for a bread, you know you're trying to go from maybe from four days to seven days or seven days to 14 days or if it's a cake you're trying to extend it by a week or 20 days or 30 days there are solutions out there where they can help you with enzyme the 
an, another good thing to control for uh, shelf life of bakery product is mold. Mold has to grows in your product, but also it has also with your pH, you can control that. You know, let's say for example, a bread naturally for fermentation will get you at the pH level of 5.2 or 5.4. So some cake products, they buffer at seven. So what can you do to lower the pH? Because on top of it, you will have to be adding preservation system to work along with it. So if you're looking at cake products, we're looking at sodium propionate, sorbic acid, and potassium sorbate are being used in cake applications. Often a combination of three, but I would say please look at your pH because sometimes it's not just throwing them in. It's about being able to understand what pH level and how much you need of which type because they function differently. So, and again, you know, that's something you can ask you know, on Bakerpedia, ask questions, love to answer. This is my favorite topic. Water activity is king to anything that lasts more than a week on the shelf. Why? Because it determines whether your product will mold or not. The water activity of a food product describes the degree to which the water is bound to the food product. Okay, its availability to participate in chemical and biochemical reactions over shelf life, and its availability to facilitate the growth of microorganisms like mold. Low water activity can help inhibit microorganism growth. While water activity is the most common used criterion for food safety and quality, go to our water activity page to learn more. On this page, the water sorption graph will show you that a water activity of 0.9 supports bacterial growth. Yes, that's where bread is. And mold growth begins at the water activity of 0.6 and above, which is most baked products. The water activity of bread and bread-like products like pita and flatbread is usually around 0.95. And the water activity of crackers are around 0.3. So is it important for you to buy a water activity meter? It really depends on your food product. For the sake of knowing, reach out to your food science department at your local universities and they can run tests for you on your product. If you're doing R&D for shelf life extension, then yes, you should invest in a water activity meter. Remember, when developing products for water activity, using sugars, salt, and honey, and hydrophilic ingredients, these will decrease your water activity without affecting rheological properties. Don't forget the tips that Richard will be sharing in his segment. So if your cakes are molding, this is what can be done immediately. One thing, we talked about the preservatives. Preservatives, if the cakes are molding, we have sorbic acid. You'll see that being used a lot. Potassium sorbate and sodium propionate are often used in that combination. But the issue is uh, on, on cake products, there is when you're using leavening agent, your pH often will be between 7 to 7.2 because it buffers due to the ingredients. What it means, it means it stays at a certain level. So if you will be throwing a lot of ingredients on top of it to try to uh, preserve you know, for, against mold, the issue is they don't taste very good. It's not highly recommended. It's good to have it but they're not very efficient. Usually at that pH level, you would get between four to maybe 8% efficiency, meaning you know whatever you're putting in is only efficient. 
at that level, at that, at that pH, usually cakes. Uh, there are some solutions. If you want to lower it, some vendors do have ways to now naturally lower the overall pH with new baking powders. And it's something that please reach out to me and I'll be glad to share it with you. Uh, another way to control mold, you know, in cakes and the most efficient, in my opinion, is to use the uh, oxygen scavengers. Oxygen scavengers is basically modifying your packaging. Once you seal it, those are the small packets that you would see in beef jerky and it says do not eat it very small. And, and it's, a, it's a silica base and there are some that are more natural that I've seen. And they use what they do, basically they absorb the oxygen from your packaging. And what it means is by depleting the oxygen from your packaging, mold cannot grow. That's the only cure to, to remove any mold to expand and grow. Because remember, molds are present in the air. Mold are always around us. So uh, oxygen scavengers are good, but there's an added cost to it. So, uh, And another one which, you know, it should be, should be part of the norm, good sanitation because molds are everywhere. They're present. We're breathing them right now. They're all around me. Uh, mold, yeast, bacteria, as we're well aware. And how do you prevent it? We cannot prevent it, but good sanitation program. And once you're packaging your products, you're putting in, make sure that people are wearing gloves every time they touch the product. And once they you know, remove from their station, make sure that the gloves get thrown away and they come back with fresh gloves because if not you know they're going to be touching things and touching the cakes so it's very important because the the least once a product comes out of the oven it's basically sanitized it's there's nothing growing on it it's after when it cools down contact with the air that's where you get the mold One of the most wonderful thing about working with bakery products for me is the food safety aspect. Every baked product served to the end consumer has a kill step. So many of our end products reach an internal temperature of above 74 degrees Celsius or 165 degrees Fahrenheit. This is why salmonella and E. coli contamination in the baking industry is very rare. When you make raw foods, which are what no-bake cookies are, you potentially create an avenue for food contamination. While sanitation and food safety are easy to control for small batches, conditions may not remain the same as you scale up. Bigger issues will surface when you employ employees to produce your no-bake cookies. In addition, without a kill step, you lose a critical control point in the food safety aspect of your product. So I do not recommend no-bake cookies that have shelf stability. However, if you do want to still pursue this risk, which could possibly put you in some legal soup, listen to what Richard's tips on extending shelf life of bakery products are. Lastly, airtight packaging with refrigeration would help your products get a longer shelf life as well. Well, there are several things that can be done, you know, simple thing to increase it over a 24 hour period. The first thing I would say, proper fermentation. How are you fermenting your donuts? Is this a straight dough? Do you give it any time? Is this coming from a mix? So that's important to know the ingredients you have in. So, and, and as we all know, the proper fermentation and the longer the fermentation that will allow for better shelf life over time. So what, what I would look at, you know, always look at measuring if possible, your pH or your TT, your to total titrable acidity. It's good measure for knowing where you should be. 
you know, and, and make sure you have no deviation to make sure the product is properly fermented. Uh, if not, there are ways, you know, you can start doing a polish, which is starting to take a portion of your flour with water, doing some pre-fermentation and adding it to your donuts. That will help. There are some levain, which becomes a little more complicated. You know, you're taking a, a, a sourdough technically and refeeding it. But in a donut, that's going to give you a clean label shelf life extension. And on top of it, you will get flavors. Uh, and then let's think from, from a formulation standpoint, what can be done also? Because if you're not using a mix, as we mentioned earlier, you could be putting more sugar, sugar in your, in your dough. Sugar has a tendency to extend the shelf life. More eggs, more egg yolks will help with the tenderness of the product. Because shelf life, as it tells, basically it's going to be a textural thing. And that's where it needs to be taken care of, you know, either through the formula, through the fermentation, or through uh, the, the, the doing a polish or doing, you know, the fermentation of the ingredients prior to. And the last thing is for shelf life also, enzymes are always fantastic. Enzyme can be used to, you know, ask the, your, your vendors or your rep that you're talking to, to see what enzyme they have for donuts. Be careful because it might change the reality of the dough. So therefore it might change the way it works. So maybe you might lose a little bit of volume, but everything can be rebalanced by knowing all the other ingredients. Coconut is high in fat. Therefore, if you do not use defatted coconut flour for your cookie, you will experience rancidity in your product. A note on rancidity. It is caused by oxidative effects on the fat molecule. This is enhanced by exposure to oxygen in the air and fluctuations in temperatures. Therefore, if you want to prevent rancidity in your baked goods, reduce the water activity if you can. Use an oxygen scavenger in your packaging and keep the storage at room temperature whenever possible. So we're talking about an icing. So icing on a cake. Usually an icing is fat-based. It has a stabilizer, sugar, so now let's think about it. Why is this not stable? So let's think of all the uh, culprits that could be creating for your icing not to be stable. Water activity is the number one. Because water activity, when you have multi-components items, and we're talking about an icing, we're talking about a cake, we're gonna put an icing on top. And if your water activity of your cake Usually your cake is going to be around eight five, and and if you're icing, it's going to be away from it basically like 0 0.9 if it's too thin, or if it's 0 0.0 when it's too too thick. The delta, the gap between the two, water will always transfer to from the highest to the lowest water activity. So as I said, if you have eight five cake, eight six cake and it's gonna to go to an icing that's gonna be about 0.8, and therefore your icing will start getting extra water. When you bring extra water to something that even though it was stable, it's gonna start getting watery and creating pool of water and getting very wet and tacky. So that's one way to try to solve the issue. So, uh, and also, you know, a lot of bakeries that I've seen and, and they make a lot of mistake is when you make an icing and you cook it up, over time the icing has a tendency to get thicker because of normal evaporation. The water evaporates, so it gets thicker, and the operator will has a tendency to just take water and throw it in. That's the big no-no, because now you're just adding water, and, and that 
icing is going to be wet over time. So you might just set for now, but once you put it in your packaging. Another thing too, and, and if we're talking about a package good, making sure that the temperature of your cakes and altogether, you know, the surface and the internal temperature has plus or minus 10 degrees from the ambient temperature of the plant in which you're in. Because if it's too, if your cakes are too hot, when you're packing, packaging your cakes, you will create condensation within your packaging and that condensation will force one mold and also will make your icing melt. Uh, and one thing too for uh, people also get rancidity within their icing and in order to prevent oxidative rancidities when the fat turns out, a lot of people in their icing as a norm are using basically fat flakes and has a really high melt point and helps out. So you just put the fat flakes and those fat flakes are being treated with antioxidant as a norm. But if you do not use fat flake, you use a different fat, I would recommend using an antioxidant. You can use uh, EDTA. It's used as a antioxidant as well. It comes in a salt form and, and it will be put into your icing, but do not mix it with any, uh, any ascorbic acid or sodium uh, bicarbonate because it will start reacting it as a negative reversal effect and it's not gonna work. Also a simple one too, uh, maybe look at tocopherol, the vitamin E is a good also cleaner label antioxidant to be used as well. And all those things are solutions for you to create better shelf stable breads and cake, sorry. So on that note, thank you very much and uh, happy baking, bye. Honey is a wonderful sweetening agent, but it does not have anti-mold properties. The one reason why you may find less mold with the honey it's because honey works great in reducing water activity. So the sugar and high fructose corn syrup. So if you would like to reduce the water activity of any system to reduce mold, look towards sugar for the answer. All FDA approved Preservatives like calcium propionate, cultured wheat, sorbic acid, potassium benzoate, or potassium sorbate are safe for consumption. Many entrepreneurs start up with selling their cookies or baked products without using preservatives. And I admire you for doing that. However, if you are going to scale up to be a multi-million dollar baking company, your shelf life has to be longer in order to meet your distribution channel. This is just the life cycle of any scalable food product. In order to keep your product safe for consumption, you have to use some kind of preservatives. Can you imagine shipping off freshly baked goods that taste and smell so good, worth thousands of dollars and it gets returned to you within a few days due to mold. That is devastating. Devastating to your bottom line. So please use a preservative to keep your product mold free. And if you'd like to seek an alternative, go to our natural preservative page and seek solutions from there. Remember, Natural preservatives are sometimes needed at twice the dosage as its artificial counterparts. So it's vital that you add the right amount and you have high sanitation standards in your bakery. Packaging absolutely helps with molding. Like Richard said, mold cannot grow without oxygen. 
Therefore, if you pack your bakery product in matte packaging and or with an oxygen scavenger, you will get an indefinite shelf life that is mold free. All right, to learn more about how to improve the quality of your baked products, come to the Bake Review seminar that Richard and I will be presenting. These are live interactive seminars that are part of the free Academy memberships. And don't forget to sign up for membership today. It's free. Till the next Ask Dr. Lynn Show Bakers, bake smart, keep safe, and keep good food safety standards. Bye.